Good evening, everybody. We're very happy to have you here with us today. Welcome. We see beautiful faces, men, women, young, older, more experienced. So it's really good to have you here, guys. Before we start, I always like to know who is in the audience. Um, so if, raise your hand if you own a company. Hmm. Raise your hand if you wish to be a startup founder. <laughs> no, not going to do that. And I know we have some business development salespeople in the audience as well. Okay, perfect. So welcome. We, today we're going to talk about snapshot on entering the US market in 2022. This year, as Liron Azrealan from Iran Capital said, 2022 is the hangover after the party of 2021. So we'll try to tackle this hangover from different angles, from the angle of the investment, the company management, and also the market sales and entrance. So um, my amazing panel here, please, I'll let you to introduce yourself because you'll do it better than me. I'll start. Hi, I'm Shaul Olmert, the co-founder and CEO of Piggy. If you guys haven't heard of Piggy yet, then you're obviously out of the loop. Uh, it's a very, uh, no, it's okay, because it's still very young uh, and in early stage. It's uh, an application for content authoring and publishing for uh, what we call the smartphone generation. So it's the, uh, the younger uh, people in the audience. And uh, yeah, this is it. I'm going to try out Piggy. Uh, I'm Noam Kaiser, a uh, partner at uh, Intel Capital. That's the uh, Intel strategic uh, venture capital arm. Uh, it's the third VC I've been fortunate enough to be a part of. Before that, it was Gemini Ventures and Offer High Tech. In between, a small failing passage as a founder. And uh, I was also the uh, business development manager for uh, Amazon Web Services in Israel, Spain, Portugal. You go. Okay. There you have your own. Let's see if this one works, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's great seeing so many entrepreneurial faces in the audience. Dr. Maria Blecher, founding director of YU Innovation Lab in New York, uh, doctor of consumer behavior and marketing, investor, startup advisor, and many other hats. That's what they say. Yeah, and I am a business development specialist. I help startups expand globally and we'll be delighted to manage this panel. So, you know, we're all talking, everybody's talking about the crisis. You see some really big um, headlines in the media, but on the other, alongside the unfortunate situations, there are also companies that still raise, that still um, investments are still made, but in a different pace. And as I said, today we're going to kind of try to understand how to manage the next six months and more of 2022. Um, so again, it seems to affect us in many ways. Companies like Etor, Fabric, Bizabu, um, laying off employees. Unfortunately, some are closing down as Soluto. Um, sorry, just my notes. Um, on the other hand, we see Kira Radinsky that just raised 45 million for Diagnostic and Qualcomm acquired by, uh, Qualcomm acquired Cellwise, one of Intel Capital's um, companies. So I would like to start with kind of understanding what happens out there. And let's start with the US market. So Maria, if you can share, how does it look from New York end? And if you can even specifically talk about the Israeli traded companies? Absolutely. Yeah. So coming from the other side of the ocean, well, I think we're all experiencing a sort of economic shift, aka the US inflation. I'm sure you heard it in the, in the news. It's above 9%, which is completely insane. The uh, interest rate just raised 0 0.75. So, you know, economic is changes, economy is changing, and you know, it affects startups, it affects the customers, it affects not, you know, the effect is larger than the startup. So if we're looking specifically at the effect it has on the startups, we can look at from several perspectives, starting with the end customer, AKA if you're a B2C startup and you're selling to an end consumer, you should be aware of the fact that people became much more price conscious. They're looking for more value for their bucks. Uh, they are revamping the way they're making decisions. They're changing patterns. Uh, they're changing the way they are making purchasing decisions. Now, on the one hand, obviously, that's a major threat. Looking from the other side, it's a great opportunity because 
at this point, people are actually are more open-minded to try new things, consider new options, and kind of in a place where they are on the verge of breaking old consumption habits. So that's another way to look at it. Uh, looking from company perspectives and B2B, very similar. Like companies, for, for the most part, even the larger corporations are cutting back on all the extras, trying to focus on their core business and trying to actually generate more income and increase revenue. Right, we were all hearing and talking about growth 2021, the party. Now everyone needs to demonstrate that they're actually able to make some money. And that's relevant for startups and that's relevant for the larger corporations as well. So here as well, like on the one hand, they're cutting on the extras. On the other hand, they're much more open to opportunities, aka POCs, partnerships, design partnerships. If you can provide the value they're looking for, either reduce their cost or increase their income, there are definitely things uh, you can do. Looking at the stock market and valuation, you know, stock prices are fluctuating. And again, not specifically, it's not personal uh, for the Israeli startups, it's across the board. I know we're Israelis and we think that the entire world is kind of, we're the center of the universe. We're not, so things are happening on different levels as well. And as a sidebar, it, uh, you agree that? We are the center, I know. So it affects us as well. Uh, what you can see is even in this situation, it creates opportunities for Israeli companies. Like you just heard Lemonade, uh, I think they acquired a company that is uh, providing uh, car insurance. So there, is, there are several opportunities for um, acquisitions. Again, across the board, vast majority of companies are cutting on extra expenses that are not generating revenues. Uh, but you know, we're in the startup sphere and ecosystem and we're supposed to be agile and agility above being just a general concept people talk about. No, that's how it's tested, right? There is a change and we need to see how we all uh, adapt. So that's, that's my take on what happens across the ocean. It's a time of opportunities for sure. Now let's, um, Noam, as um, representing big American corporates as Intel, I would like to know your point of view on one hand on the investment of such corporation, and on the other hand, if we want to sell to companies like Intel, how, what, what would be their uh, perspective on that these days? Okay, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to uh, represent corporate America, but let's, uh, um, nobody's safe. Uh, what Maria said about the impact, the overall impact, this is a true financial slowdown, similar to 2008, not similar to 2001, which was really a tech bubble exploding. Um, everyone is impacted. Um, and if you're looking at it from the NVIDIA, Intel, AMD perspective, or other corporates in other fields, uh, everyone is beginning to focus on the core. This is not the time for experiments. This is not the time to focus on things that maybe would have been like in the past. Intel was venturing into sports, into media. That's not happening anymore, not anytime soon. So there is a lot of consolidation to the core, to the abilities. And yes, one of the biggest acquisitions that Intel has ever made, that just made here in Israel, Tower Semiconductors for 6.2 billion, but it's in order to enhance the core, the foundry business of uh, taping out uh, chips. So nobody's safe and everyone is responding. A lot of the things that would have been adventurous are not happening and you're beginning to feel it. And you're even seeing downsizing within business units across all corporates. That's on the high level depressing side. Um, as far as Intel Capital and the investment, there's not much change because we've been doing this for a long time. It's a very established part of Intel. It's actually a business unit within Intel that generates like a billion dollars in revenue every year. So we're not changing anything. We have that ability. We're not even changing the full-on investments into the companies. Um, but actually for us, just the Intel Capital, and I'll finish with that. On the Intel Capital front, there wasn't much difference because we were one of those VCs that didn't join the hype. We, and, and we sort of pushed our companies not to get ahead of themselves. Don't, don't do the Icarus thing and fly towards the sun because it, it's not going to last. Um, and not because we're so smart. We're all scarred from 2001 and 2008. Uh, so it was business as usual. And here in Israel, we're about to complete our third new investment locally this year. A lot of follow-on investments. The pace hasn't really changed. Um, 
but yeah, the term sheets are sort of back to normal. So <laughs> bottom line, we can, startups can approach you. <laughs> okay, well, open for business. And Shaul, now you have been to some few crises yourself as a CEO, as a founder. Yeah, I'm an old man. You have some experience that you can share with us. So what, how do you see this from, from your point of view? Uh, I think we need to take a bird's eye view and figure out that technology is actually more and more entrenched in the day-to-day -day of people all around the world in pretty much everything we do, right? We, we even lost the ability to... to navigate from 74th Street to 75th without Google Maps. Uh, we can't, you know, order food. We can't communicate with people without digital technology. So the place of technology in our lives is only increasing. And sure, you know, I'll, I'll talk specifically about the current downturn. It's not a linear path. It's like it looks, I was actually thinking maybe it's because we are at Microsoft's office. It kind of looks like the Microsoft stock. Uh, Microsoft has been a public company for the better part of 40 years, I want to say. And uh, sometimes it experienced, I remember a 25% downfall in their stock price um, um, back in the day. But if you're, if you're taking a step back and looking at it from, um, uh, from afar, you'll see that it's, it's constantly going up. So yes, there are little twists and turns, but generally there's a trajectory. And same goes for technology. So I think we'll only see technology more embedded in our day-to-day -day lives and the need for technologies and technology infrastructure And technology integration is only going to increase. That's why it's a great time to start a new company. It's also a great time to start a new company because when the market is boiling, there's too much noise around. Okay, everybody wants in, all the hitchhikers. Uh, and they're taking away a lot of the attention, a lot of the capital. There's, uh, there's too much demand. Too many people are eager to play in. And so the prices are going up and it becomes unaffordable for pretty much everyone. Uh, specifically, six months ago, we tried to find developers, you know, people who write code. It was literally impossible. We had to, we had to get people, I don't know, like people in India and people who work part-time and work from, uh, from an airplane and, you know, had to improvise and the costs were unbearable. And guess what? Now they're back to normal salaries, which we can actually afford, which we can actually justify. So I think the downturn is actually a good correction. Uh, all in all, obviously, it hurts, right? When, when the downfall hits, it's, um, it's not a cosmetic surgery. It's kind of like a, 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 a hurricane that, uh, that, that uh, doesn't distinguish between the, the uh, proper businesses and, uh, and the one that don't have the um, justification to live. But all in all, I think that this is a great time to start new things. And uh, I don't know if it's... Uh, I can't point a specific... point in time, but in five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we'll see that everything is, is much upward from where it is today. And, you know, there will be further uh, declines and everything else, but all in all, um, technology is a good investment. And this is the time to, <laughs> to go and try and, and, yeah, to go and do it. And I also want to ask, so, you know, you talked about the prices, for example, of the, of, of the salaries, the unbearable salaries, the bubble that like everybody used to say up until a few months ago. And now it, hold, it all changed. And I know some startups that some conversation I had with startups, some of them said, oh, my God, I was so lucky to be able to get investment in a high valuation. And other ones, shit, I missed the train. Now I'm like, you know, so no, I'm. On that, on that end, how do you view the, the change of valuation in the market? And also, what would be your advice to startups that are now running for their um, seed or a... Like Shaul said, a blessed mm -hmm. correction. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if... if it, it, it was funny. I'm, I'm not going to name the name of the fund. Well, there was one fund that just announced that they have a new measurement. Uh, if you have $100 million dollars in sale, then you are a minotaur. And I said, no, that's unicorn. You're supposed to have a valuation of a billion if you sell 100 million. That's what, that is actually the same fund that invented the term unicorn. So we're, we're coming back to some sort of normality. And I guess the, the, the worst thing that a lot of startups did, and I'm, I'm not blaming founders, I'm blaming VCs for pushing in too much money at too high valuation. It's all, it always starts with too much money. Um, they've created valuation that there is no chance in hell that the startup would justify two, three, four years down the line. So 
And yes, I'm very happy that startups have more money to experiment, more money to try not to overpay yeah, because that doesn't help anyone. Um, but the valuations were a sin and the folks deciding what they are are the sinners and those are VCs. Um, so I, I, you have to think about it. You think, okay, we got it at a great valuation. A, a, a startup raising money is not a something, you you're not supposed to say congratulations, you're supposed to say good luck because that's a commitment. What am I going to do now for the next two years with this money? And one of the things is, create or achieve those milestones that are going to help me secure the next finding, financing round in a reasonable valuation to bring in those next investors. This didn't happen for two and a half years in Israel and, and in the Valley. So I, I think it's a blessed correction. I think that the same rules that applied before are coming back. And I think that in the long term, 30,000 feet view, when we look back at this, it will just be a bump in the road and things. You will see a lot of companies that are now raising in a flat round or down round. The good thing is that they won't have to explain it. People will, oh, that was 2021. Okay, then that's okay. Uh, unless you've been really irresponsible and doing a lot of unreasonable things. But um, right now, cash is king, not valuation. Uh, if, if you can get the money, if, if you're looking at the one thing that troubles most of my portfolio companies, it's runway. Tricky question for the three of you. Do you think there is safe sectors right now that it's better to pursue than others or that could... And get better Banking. investment. <laughs> I think it's cyclical, and there are always um, there, are, there are trends in the market. So uh, I don't know. A couple of years ago, everything was fintech. Now we have too many fintech companies. Uh, you know, there's no way that that even half of them will survive and justify. And that's okay. You know, everybody's taking a bet, and some will make more successful bet than others. But when I start a company, I never ask myself. Uh, what's hot in the market right now? Because I think it's the wrong way to look at things because the company that you're building is not supposed to be, we're not day traders. It's not supposed to be acquired within six months, right? So the, the trends will change. Uh, I want to do something that I really believe in, that I really feel that I can bring value and that we can really innovate with. And then, you know, over time, you know, I'm sure that, we'll, uh, that there will be times in which we'll get undervalued because the market is a little bit bearish and suspicious. And there will be other times in which the market will overhype. And then we have to be very careful to remember that uh, we can use this hype, but not get carried away because eventually those trends will go away too. So, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, these guys will do a better job than me in naming the sectors that are hotter right now. I mean, media advertising is not great. And, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, uh, security infrastructure still is. But uh, again, I've seen, uh, you, you mentioned how old I am before that. You know, I've seen oh, like I the... The, uh, the market sector known as now, that's now called cyber, it used to be called security. Uh, you know, I've seen it in, in so many cycles. I remember the times in which it was trash. Nobody would get anywhere. Norm wouldn't give you a penny to invest in anything that had to do with cyber security because it was so oversaturated. I remember that uh, I was part of a venture fund uh, back, you know, to my shame. I have to admit it, you I'm know, sorry. in my roots, I'm... Uh, I'm um, but, but I'm all cured now. And I was part of a venture fund in 2000. And uh, we were uh, uh, looking, like many others, we were looking at investing in, uh, in search engines. And we said, no, there's no, I mean, the, this market is dead. It's already owned by Tommy and, and Alta Vista. And no one will ever set foot in this market again. So just to say, things come in cycle. You know, if you want to start, start a search engine and, and compete with Google, I think it's obviously an ambitious task. Nonetheless, if you feel like you have anything to offer in that sense, do it. Start investing in it. See where it takes you. Uh, you know, nobody's uh, nobody's uh, meant to um, uh, be at the top of the pyramid forever. Uh, and just bring Maria? It back to, to Maria, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, everybody hurts. There is no good segment. It's about finding a cool, big problem and solving it. There, there is no safe segment right now. And by the way, about the questions of the sectors, this is recorded, but I can take it out of the edits if, if you don't want to be quoted. So don't <laughs> worry, you can share it with us. That's fine. It's going to be interesting to look back in a few years. So just to piggyback on what we're here for a reason, right? So to piggyback, to piggyback on what Noam said, it's looking beyond startups or uh, startup sectors or across sectors. It's about finding the problem and providing a solution that is a painkiller rather than a vitamin. If you're able to literally kill a pain in a good way, 
then you're probably more safe because in today's market, again, we were speaking about that earlier, companies are looking for specific solutions, very, very clear value proposition, very, again, laser focused uh, solutions. So you're able to provide that across the board, whether it's cyber or fintech, you'll probably survive and maybe thrive. If you're not, you know, that's the downside of the wave. So it all comes down to solving the current pains and doing it as good as you can. And Shaul, back to you. With What would you recommend startups that are now going out there to raise money? Uh, it's not, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time advising other founders about raising money because uh, as a company founder, that's the majority of what you do. The majority of my job, I remember that I tried to explain to my kids what their father actually does, <laughs> and, you know, what I'm actually doing at work. And uh, the honest to God truth is I spend the majority of my time either raising money or making sure that, that the budget is kept, trying to focus uh, how will we get to the next round in a favorable position. So it's a big part of what a founder does. Um, look, all I'm saying is that there's a lot of capital out there, a lot of funds to raise a lot of money, and they're looking to deploy this money, so they may be a little bit more cautious, more suspicious, they lost their FOMO, they're no longer hunted by this uh, unbearable hunger to make as many investments as possible before the next guy does, but they're still, you know, they're not going to make money out of not investing, so at the end of the day, they're looking to deploy this capital. So, um, you know, I guess you can find, if you, if you Google this uh, search query, you'll find a lot of sound advice about how to project uh, more uh, safely and how to, um, you know, how to answer the current uh, zeitgeist for investors in terms of what they're looking for. I have nothing to add to that. I will just say that it's a lot about doing something that you really believe in. Uh, try to make educated estimates about how, you, how much you can grow. Don't try to, for instance, uh, sell a story that you're going to grow to to be a unicorn or to sell for, uh, to sell that, uh, to have a hundred million dollars in sales just because you feel like this is the kind of benchmark that a certain invest investor is looking for. Be honest with yourself. And eventually, uh, you know, I know it sounds like a cliche, but when I raise money, I actually, uh, I feel like people invest in my companies because they feel like I'm being brutally honest about where we stand. They ask me, how are you going to make money for an early stage company? And I'm telling them, I have no idea. And honestly, it's a waste of my time to think about it at the moment. But I think that if, we, if we're able to generate the kind of value that we think the company will, I think there's, you know, there are a lot of models that can apply to it. And I think that at this stage, it's a great answer. And uh, you know, even if it's not a great answer, it's the only answer I can give which is good. So you know, honestly, uh, I think that rather than try to think about what our investors are looking for, Try to ask yourself, what is my company bound to be? What is my vision? What am I planning to do? And stick to that. Chances are you'll find people that subscribe to that vision. And if you have to pretend to be someone else in order to take their money, it's probably not a good long-term partnership anyway. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep the questions for the end, if you don't mind, David. Um, Maria, now we... Many startups, Israeli startups, approach you for your accelerator. Oh, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. So you scout for startups to join your accelerator. What would be, um, let's say, the, the common impression that you get from them wanting to go to the US, sell to the market? So, well, you know, again, going back to the point that Israel is the center of the world, and Israeli entrepreneurs feel that when they arrive to New York, New York is just, you know, people are there, the VCs with open checkbooks and just waiting to write the checks and the customers are lining up like, you know, it's the release of the first Apple, of the first iPhone for the product. And when they arrive there, well, usually it's not the case. So uh, they need to actually start learning and exploring the market. And I would say that that probably the foundational advice and the foundational action item that every Israeli startup that is, has even some distant ideas of entering the American market should follow is study and learn and explore and research the American market. Yes, it can be a tedious task. Yes, it can be costly and time consuming, but making this bold move without having 
at least some kind of validation that the problem that you are solving and that you're so sure that that's, you know, that's how it looks like and this, that's the best, best solution while sitting here in Israel, well, you may find and be surprised, not necessarily pleasantly surprised, that the landscape in the US looks very different, that the problem looks different, that the solutions that exist you know, are not the ones that you can find on Google when you're doing your kind of search. So my take is always take the time in make the investment, make, make the effort, study, learn, explore the landscape and your target market. You'll be surprised how much you don't know with all your assumptions, with all the notions that you speak to people here. If your target is the American market, you should be there at least for the research. It may either save you a lot of pain and money in the future, and it can also set you up for success. So that's, you know, whoever is thinking about moving again across the ocean and penetrate that market, do your homework. That's my advice. It was before, you know, this, um, the current economy, and I would say these days even more because the market is changing. So the research you've done six months ago or, or last year might not be relevant anymore because the companies uh, changed their focus, the consumers change their behavior. So you really want to be up to date with uh, and be aware of the changes in the market you're, you're entering. So make sure you know the new rules of the game eventually. Yeah. And, you know, with that being said, I want to take the, the spotlight to this sole entrepreneur. Um, which one of you actually manage team in your companies? Awesome. And more, I'm sure more to come. So as, as leaders, as, as the one who's, you know, who's managing the company, navigating it towards the investment or towards the clients, obviously you need to have different leadership skills these days and make sure you get it to the right place and make sure you get your, your team uh, still excited and still motivated to help you go through those hard times. And that's where I want to ask you again, Shaul, um, what would be your recommendation for um, navigating uncertain times? I know you had, um, have a lot of experience in, in such situation with uh, PlayBuzz. I've seen it all. <laughs> You've seen uh, it all. Look, I'll, uh, I'll, I, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I'll, I'll uh, stick to the same value and uh, go with transparency. I think that in today's day and age, people are much more educated than they used to be. So, you know, it used to be, I don't know, 20 years ago, nobody besides the CEO understood anything about what's happening outside of the office, right? It's like everything that had to do with fundraising and valuations and setting the company and all that sounded like science fiction. Uh, today, it's not the case. Everybody has a lot of information. They're exposed to it. They understand it. So uh, you can't really get away with... Um, portraying a very detailed picture of what things looks like. We, we, we have an, uh, a weekly whole hands meeting at the company and we're a small company, so we communicate every day anyway. But we do this because we're trying to give people clarity about where we stand and we give them a lot of information that a few years ago it would, it would have sounded um, uh, you know, unthinkable to share. We tell them exactly how much money do we have in the bank, how much money are we spending every month, uh, you know, what is the plan, um, for instance, all of our board meetings, we, we do them uh, via video conferencing, so we record them, and then we share them with the entire company. Granted, th there could be cases in the future where there's going to be a lot more sensitive information and, and we'll uh, uh, restrict some of that. But generally speaking, right now, I have nothing to hide from my employees. So our, uh, I guess to answer your question, our leadership style is just being very transparent. We let them see everything and they ask the tough questions. And we give them the, the honest answers, which sometimes are, we don't know. You know, we, uh, we, we just raised money, uh, uh, thank God, uh, a few months ago, lucky timing. Uh, but before we did, we were getting pretty close to the end of the runway. And we were telling people that, okay, we have, I don't know, six, nine more months to live. And, uh, and we need to raise money. And, uh, you know, here is the number of funds we've met with. And here are the number of funds that got back to us. And again, luckily for us, it ended up pretty quickly and, and we signed it up well, but we were totally prepared for a scenario in which we'll, you know, the employees will be completely aware of the fact that, uh, that we have uh, concerns and that we have risks. But, you know, I just, I think like, uh, you know, I've seen too many situations in which people were completely blown away by the company being shut down or having to decrease expenses and, and let go and let a lot of people go. 
And nobody in the room had any idea that this is where things are going. So I really believe in transparency. I feel like it's the only way uh, in this day and age to have people's trust and support for the long run. So it's interesting because you're talking on, of course, how you deal and lead your employees and your companies. Noam, you wear the advisor hat as an investor. And when you deal with entrepreneurs, with founders, what is the one main common concern that you get? And what would be your answer? Well, first of all, I think I sort of shortly touched on it. Right now it's runway. Right now it's how do we clear? Nobody asks you how long do we need to clear for because they know I don't know. So they don't ask me. But um, basically the, the resounding question is one, yes. What can you, you do to help us bridge this? And this is sometimes where we can come in and, and help further. Um, but also one of the things that I as a sort of portfolio manager have, I have some sort of perspective of 30,000 feet view of in let's say Intel Capital, 250 companies. What are other guys doing? What are they experiencing? What's working for them? What's not? Uh, so try to provide some of that. Um, how did companies, so, and by the way, one of the strongest things that we can do for our companies is actually bring together CEOs because I don't need to tell this guy and I probably don't need to tell a lot of you that the CEO is the single loneliest position there is. It doesn't have to be. But it's great when there's another person that knows exactly what you're going through. So when you're connecting CEOs, especially in times like this, that makes a lot of sense. Um, my main advice to CEOs at this time is let's support winning efforts. Let's not be uh, courageous or adventurous about things that at the moment don't contribute to value. And yes, value translates, first of all, to sales. We have to hit goals. We know we're not going to hit the goals this year. Let's redefine them. But also, let's not make the mistake of 2020, 2021, when the only plan was best case scenario. <laughs> let's, man, this is no longer the case. Let's see what is the worst case scenario and how we prepare for it. And let's also write ourselves some sort of middle ground of what are the signals, what are the KPIs, always measure. That, that's the one thing. What KPI do we not meet that, that means, okay, this is worst case scenario, we have to start shutting down. We have to tighten the belt. We have to cut people. We have to cut salaries. We have to cut capabilities. Um, and there's always more than one plan. There's plan A, okay, this is going to hurt. But if we just do this, we can bridge it. Plan B is no, this is really going to hurt. Right now, we're only dealing with survival. We even have to hit the product, which is a really dramatic thing to do. But you can only get an educated decision on that if you have KPIs, if you define what success is, what goal is, what is red line. And once they have that, first of all, they have a plan. And like Charles said, when they share that plan with their team, people know where they are. Everyone performs as best as they can, considering where we are right now. Thank you for that. And I want to take the perspective of Maria from the accelerator point of view. So as an accelerator, what would be, how would you support them, the leaders, the leadership, the founders? Yeah, absolutely. I will go back to my initial point, validation, validation, validation. You should be out there talking to your potential customers, exploring the target market, really understanding the landscape. I think that's the value we bring uh, in the YU Innovation Lab. And that's the value across the board that is much needed for so many early stage Israeli startups. Because once you, well, let's start with the worst case scenario. You can build an entire, let's go to the, I'm not, I'm, I'll put the product aside, but an entire marketing strategy based on a false assumption. And the strategy can be outstanding, but if you, don't know who you're targeting. And if you don't know their pains and what keeps them, them up at night, whether those are B2C or B2B, then your excellent campaign will not deliver, AKA it will not generate the leads, it will not generate sales, and you will end up at a point where, you know, we're plan B, like Noam said. So the first stage before all of that, really you know, studying, exploring, researching, talking to customers, talking to companies, don't take one or two or five, as many as you can. Go to, uh, to accelerators in, you know, if you're in fintech, find the biggest fintech accelerator in the States. If you're in you know, edtech, find the biggest accelerator in edtech and try to speak to as many people as you can. Now I'll say it with a caveat, uh, speak to the right people. Very often when you speak to people, 
you know, you'll get those amazing advices. And again, typically people, you know, the CB part tend to please, and they're less likely to tell you that they don't like your product or they, or they don't really need your solution. So typically the answers that you're going to get are positive. I would say, you know, take those with a hint of salt, put them aside and look for the ones that are providing you more value and insight, AKA why they would not you know, buy your product or why they would not pay for your service or how are they currently solving the problem? Because guess what? The fact that you developed a solution and as amazing as it gets, somehow the work, including your potential target market has existed till this point and they, were, they managed to solve the problem. So understanding what they were doing till you know, so far and how they managed through it will help you again to polish your value proposition and to be laser focused. And that's part of the work that we do. Um, I, wanna, I wanna add to what Maria said and actually I take it from a different angle. I feel like, and look, I'm not saying that, that Maria is wrong. I mean, I'm not telling you don't validate, follow your own ideas, be disconnected from reality. That's not my message, but I will say that when you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to foresee something that doesn't exist yet. And the majority of the feedbacks that you're going to get are going to be negative. So, for instance, when um, you know when we started Piggy uh, two years ago, one of the as I said, it's a content authoring platform, and one of the main use cases that we foresaw was for people for uh, kids to use it for school projects. We said nobody likes to do school projects; they're very outdated. They look today exactly like they looked a hundred years ago. But today, kids use social media. They use a smartphone. You know, why don't we let them create their school project on a smartphone? We approached teachers and school principals and asked about it, and the main answer was no. You know, we're not interested in disruption to the way we do things right now. We're kind of used to it. This is the way it has always been. This is how we grade things. This is how we review things. Um, and it would have been stupid of us not to listen to this feedback. At the same time, it would have been stupid, equally stupid of us to accept it as a force of nature and assume that uh, this is a boundary we can't accept. We saw, okay, so we understand the resentment. But we also understand that there's a boiling need for uh, people to express themselves in a way that's more native. And, you know, again, you got to. Um, so my message is not don't ask and don't listen. But you also have to understand that uh, when, you, when we're doing something entrepreneurial, uh, the answers are not obvious. And if you come up with a concept that everybody's nodding, and I know it sounds like a cliche, but trust me. If everybody subscribes to your vision, it means you're too late. You're doing something which is too obvious. And I've seen that around, and I bet Noam has as well. You know, you don't invest in something that is already out there. It just, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't have growth potential. You have to take a risk. You have to follow your lead and your conviction. It's great to bounce it with reality and get feedbacks. That's the way you shape it and, and funnel it and kind of design it. But, um, you know, it can't be based only on the external feedbacks you're getting. So anyway, I just... And that comes out from it. experience, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> That's the most interesting part of the discussion between investors and founders when they tell you, these are the signals that I'm picking up that this is going to happen. And when they come up with something really interesting that you didn't think about, and of course you didn't think about because they're the experts of that field, that's where the discussion becomes interesting. You know, that's, that's the good stuff. So let me ask you if you have any more um, startup stories, again, of how to penetrate the U.S. market right now. When we talk about the marketing and sales aspect, and again, a lot now is about if you already have a product, many of those companies are trying to focus on the revenue to be able to not only rely on investment and, and so on or get their pilot faster. Um, do you have any advice apart from what already was mentioned about what should we do now in the rest of the year to reach those corporations if it's SaaS or Enter the market. I have a horrible story and Please. I have a good one. Uh, <laughs> one of our portfolio companies was doing one of the things that you'll notice a lot of Israeli startups, like Playbuzz at the time, and a lot of them are very generous with their time and their willingness to help young startups use them as the design partner in the first. And that's great. But the, American have, the Americans have grew, uh, grown up. And when they see the logos, you come say, How many of these are Israelis? They're already, you know, they've sharp enough to have figured out that that's how we get there. Um, one of our portfolio companies has been unable to penetrate for a long time the American market and, and until one of, it was actually one of the American investors looking at it and said, well, I know what you guys are doing. 
but I looked at your marketing material in your website. And that's a completely different story. Like you sound so generic that if I take someone that has no idea what your company does, they will never think that you're doing what you're doing. And this, the solution we came up with was, why don't we go back to the first, the first users, the first customers that gave us the trust? Because they were the ones that we worked with to realize what the concept of the company should be in the first place. I said, what do you think about this message? And the answer was, of course, this sucks. And, and then we reshaped it and started running it in American English and, and really explain how we differ. So that's one. It sounds obvious. It really isn't. The fact we speak English does not mean we speak American. So that's one thing. Um, one good thing that I saw that companies do by now, because this is already the fourth decade of Israeli startups selling to the U.S., yeah. Mind-blowing. There are a lot of American professionals that have already worked for three, four Israeli companies in the past. If you can grab them, that's awesome, because they know how to work with these Michiganers on the other side, these Israeli terrorists coming to take over the United States. It's, it's great when they already know the culture, when they already know how to cruise through the overselling and some of the bullshit. Uh, and they also have a Rolodex of existing customers that they know how to address. If you can find those gems, the folks that have been in the space, have worked with and for Israeli companies, some of the, a lot of them will be vacant now. This is one of the pluses of them. Try and find some of those. And yes, an Israeli in the state working for you is not the same as an American in the states working for you. So those are kind of my tips. And also, um, Tal isn't here, but... Um, Microsoft, AWS, and Google Cloud Platform have some plans. Not all of them make a huge difference, but they have some plans that help startups work with customers, especially cloud-native customers. Use them. In general, don't be ashamed. Use everything. Kill, lie, steal, and stab. Any way that gets you to lead is legitimate, especially now. Yeah, absolutely. So marketing. Uh, start early, you know, don't wait to the point that you have a fully designed product to, you know, design your logo and put it out there. Start with the research, identify your market. If you're developing a product, let's, let's assume that you know, you already know who they are and start building your crowd and your audience early. You're, you know, literally simultaneously, you're developing your product, you need to develop your market. So by the time you launch, you already have and gained some credibility, some social proof. Uh, people will be looking, people and companies will be looking for that. You're new, so the more trust you gain from the market, the better for you. Design partnerships, POCs, paid, that's how you know you're on the right track. Customer traction for B2B, engagement, all of that. Again, the, the sooner the better. So by the time you're out there, you already some of that cred these credentials are uh, along with you. I actually did it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we've all watched enough American television and movies to uh, believe that we actually know what we're getting into. And then, you know, you land in New York and guess what? The taxis are indeed yellow and uh, the streets are numbered. So it's very easy to, uh, to find your way around. And, you know, the hot dogs are as great as advertised. But uh, it doesn't take long before you realize that you're not a local, <laughs> that despite the fact that we speak the same language and, you know, we, we've seen it on television and everything else, it's different. It's just different people. Uh, and I think that a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of my gray hair came from the experiences of assuming that I'm talking to people whom I have uh, much common denominator with and realizing that Despite everything we have in common, there are also a lot of cultural differences that you have to be very sensitive to. And I think that the first thing is losing your arrogance. You know, when I came to New York, I always had uh, jokes about baseball. You know, who wants to watch baseball? It's such a boring sport and everything else. You know, don't tell baseball jokes to Americans. Um, and with the years, not only did I become a big baseball fan, and I actually love baseball, and I, sometimes I actually put an alarm clock for 3 a.m. so I can wake up and watch a baseball game live. And I'm not even talking about playoffs games. I'm talking about regular season games. So, you know, I'm really much into it. Um, I guess the result of spending so many years in the U.S. But you have to realize that, you know, you have to kind of lose this uh, arrogance and this cultural bias of assuming that you know better because... Um, uh, the U.S., just like any other market, has its own culture and has its own narratives and has its own cultural heritage. 
And if you want to be a part of it, you have to play ball. You have to, first of all, respect it and kind of adjust to it. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, a venture capitalist just gave you a really good advice. And that's, you know, honestly, I, as I said, I hope I'm not quoted. Uh, all right. But uh, it's really about, I find that the most success I had with hiring in the US is when I hired people who previously worked with Israeli companies, who have the, ex who have the experience of, um, you know, for instance, when you schedule a meeting for Sunday and you forget that the people in the US don't work on Sundays, it can be perceived as extremely, not only rude, as actual aggressive. And of course, you didn't, you didn't mean it to be aggressive, but that's the way it's perceived. So if someone already went through this exercise and they kind of know that, okay, you know, I should just tell them that, hey, guys, as a reminder, we don't actually work on Sundays, uh, just like you don't want us to schedule any meetings for Fridays, don't, you know. Uh, there are exceptions. Um, exceptions, and that's okay. <laughs> That's true. But, you know, just an example to say, uh, again, you, you really got to embrace the culture and understand that. I think that having people who already went through this cultural shock is, uh, is important. By the way, I don't know, I have any data on it, but I bet you that uh, founders that didn't move with their company to the U.S. but already worked there before probably have a better success ratio uh, than those. Because, again, they already confronted a lot of the issues uh, it's a lot about style, about uh, what are the things, you know, just as a broad generalization, um, the U.S. culture uh, is a lot more about nuances. There are certain, I remember that my first American boss once told me that he suggests that I will take a different path, and I listened to his suggestion and decided not to accept it. And, um, you know, obviously it's not, it wasn't an option. So I just got to say it's like uh, a lot of things... I remember that I was perceived by many locals as rude, as aggressive, as obnoxious. And, you know, sometimes I deserved it. But sometimes it was just because I, you know, I honestly, I just spoke to them the way, the same way I used to speak to Israelis. So you're not among Israelis. You're a tourist here. You're a guest. Uh, you know, try to observe and try to listen before you try to impose uh, your own habits. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think. Learn, learn, about the <laughs> learn about the shit sandwich. Something that we need yeah, to absolutely. And another, so Shaul, I think those are, were great examples. Lose your judgment. Israelis come to the U.S., including myself, and we look at the world from, again, our own perspective, and we're judging. They're not celebrating Memorial Day in the proper way. They are spending their Sundays in, you know, in the wrong way. Once we begin to judge, we cannot be embedded in the culture. And if that's your target market, and this is your, these are the people you want to sell to, you really need to step back, be humble, and learn. And another great tip, add the American holiday calendar to your own one. So you don't schedule Very meetings, important. not only on Sundays, but on Memorial Day and Labor Day and all Columbus the other, Day. Columbus Day and all the other federal <laughs> days. Uh, it will save you a lot of the kind of Israeli mistakes. So uh, It's like a friend from the UK sent me one day, Happy Yom Kippur. And I'm like, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to share something that actually summarizes some of the examples that you gave. <laughs> Sorry. A few years back, I just started working with a startup company in the sales, uh, like sales uh, system. And very shortly after I started working with them, they sent me to the U.S. to speak at this event, to raise money and so on. So I set, the, set a meeting with an investor at the World Trade Center. 50th floor, we're entering the meeting room, and you know, behind him, I see the, uh, the Statue of Liberty, like the dream. He says, okay, he was very, very serious. Okay, go ahead, you can pitch. So I shared the pitch, and then he was still serious, and he said, can I be honest? I'm like, yes, I think this company is a fiction. I think it doesn't exist. Now, you know what happens in my mind in the, in the same moment. I'm like, what, what do you mean? The company just raised money. They sell in the Europe. Who do you think you are? And then I, this inner chatter was like, wait, this is a very smart man. There are probably a very important lesson here that I don't want to miss. So that was like split second in my mind. And I'm like, okay, can you please share? Why, why do you think this company doesn't exist? You know something? Our analyst checked your company. The information you just told me doesn't match with a, with a deck and doesn't match with some information online. One of the founders still works for NICE. And then he started just giving me checklist one after one after one of every bit of information that wasn't 
correlating or wasn't make, didn't make sense. The only thing I could say was thank you, thank you, thank you. And this was a big lesson because in most cases you will not know, you would not know why you, got, you didn't get into the deal flow. Nobody would be, or most people I think, or most investors would necessarily be kind enough like he did in American Israeli settings to tell me why he didn't want to invest or, or hear more from us. So that was a very important point on how to adjust yourself to the American culture. By the way, all of this, and, and I'm again following up on another point by Shaul, it's not about being someone that you are not. It's not about trying to play a part, a role that isn't you. Just learn the language of the natives, learn the, the culture that you need to work with. And of course, bring back, bring the Israeli chutzpah and cutting the right corners and saying what it is that you think needs to be said. Just learn how to do it. Don't lose at the end of the day, they still come here. They invest a huge amount of money here. They buy our products. We've got something going on, but but you have to understand your market. Uh, like this is not your market. So we'll move to the questions soon. Uh, I just have to say, um, Meital, she's very sorry she couldn't join us for Microsoft for startups. They run accelerators, obviously that help startups in their go-to market and global expansion. So she sends. Um, Hi, and apologizes. And yeah, I would love to get your questions. This is the time. David. So I'll just repeat the question. If we can share the difference between B2B and B2C regarding the downturn. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It's a, it's a tough one, so he gave it to me. Then that, that's Shaolin and Acha. No, but <laughs> sure you do. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, the the challenge with a real financial slowdown is that's exactly what it targets. We are talking about a slowdown. By the way, an intentional, a targeted slowdown of consumption. Um, so that's exactly where the plus side of what Shaul comes into play. If you can show that you're the next step in something that we already do, we just get to do it much better if we use an application or we use some sort of online service, especially if it makes something more efficient, quicker, saves money, prevents us from making mistakes. And I think that that's actually the, similar, the similarity to B2B right now. Because B2B right now, by the way, the question was the difference between B2C and B2B2C. No, B2B or B2C. So right now, both animals behave the same in the fact that they are now going with the economy of the essential, not the economy of, okay, this could be cool. Um, and, and I think that you have a, an even bigger challenge with B2C because in B2C, um, well, you know, there's... The channels are much more challenging. You have to achieve a certain mass in order to matter. And at the end of the day, you're trying to get into people's phones as the next app. That is almost impossible. Um, I guess that's almost <laughs> impossible. Almost <laughs> impossible. Um, but but that, that's something that you have to take into account. That right now, being something really cool, that should wait for another time. I'm not saying don't develop it, but if you want to deploy it, there could be better times for it. I, I'm seeing that my companies right now that are succeeding, that are meeting their goals, are those that are really solving a problem or extending their customers' runway, getting their dollars to buy more. Uh, I want to add something. I just, um, uh, this morning, I, I have a blog on Calcalist, which is Israel's uh, um, highly, uh, most highly circulated uh, financial uh, newspaper. And uh, I just wrote a blog post today on Calcalist about pivoting and about the... Um, you know, the art of constantly reevaluating what you do and changing and everything else. And I think that especially at these times, you constantly need to ask yourself, you know, am I doing the most viable thing for my business right now? Because maybe the plan I had six months ago was a very viable plan, but since some things change in the market, you kind of have to fine tune it. And sometimes when we think about pivot, sometimes we think about uh, complete turnarounds, like, uh, you know, like Nokia, for instance, that started from manufacturing rubber boots and ended up manufacturing cellular phones. But sometimes pivots are not that uh, deterministic. Sometimes it's just a series of slow changes that occur over time. 
And I think that right now, this is the skill you need to develop. You need to constantly ask yourself. So for instance, for us, uh, since you mentioned the um, difficulty in distributing apps, uh, we are now doing taking a little bit of a shift of doing something that's outside of our app. We, we spent the last two years developing an app, and now we are developing an extension that enables people who don't have the app to still use the system. So it's kind of like, and you know, I don't, I don't know if it's going to work. So you know, I can't, uh, I can't say much about uh, this being a good idea. But it's, it represents the line of thinking of trying to always, you know, to understand that when you run into obstacles, yes, you try to tackle them, but you also have to find to, uh, to try and find ways around them and be creative. So this is a, this is an. A, an important time for creativity. It became essential for survival in uh, in the current downturn. Thank you very much. Yes, Yoa. So I imagine that we will all agree that the people factor is one of the main success and failure aspects. I'm interested to understand, and, uh, and thank you, Noah, for your tip uh, about uh, hiring uh, people that have worked in uh, Israeli companies. Good tip. But I'm interested to, to understand your view on what are the main mistakes that you see CEOs are making in hiring in the U.S. So I'll just repeat that to make sure everybody heard it. So what are the main, sorry, uh, mistakes that CEOs ha ha doing when hiring in the U.S.? I'll start really quickly and say that uh, the primary mistake is realizing that because of the different culture, um, you know, I was, uh, I remember telling Tom, my, uh, my uh, co-founder at Playbus at my previous company, I said, you know, at the U.S. office, nobody stays after 6 p.m., that's uh, around the center. So it's like everybody leaves at 6 p.m. And so, you know, you know, and I was, all, I was really bummed by it because I remember like in the, in the Israeli office, everybody stays till 9, 10, 11, and we all have dinner together. And we, uh, you know, then we go drinking after work. And in the U.S., uh, in the U.S., it wasn't the case. And then uh, Tom mentioned something like uh, shed a light on something that I, uh, that I wasn't aware of. He said, yes, but they also, they, they come at 9 a.m. in the morning as opposed to the Israeli office that, you know, some of them don't show up before lunch. So uh, again, understanding, uh, trying to apply the, the, your same habits. I, I saw the fact that they're stepping out of the office at 6 p.m. as a sign of lack of commitment, lack of enthusiasm. It wasn't, you know, it's not the case. It's just that in the U.S., they, uh, and of course, it's a broad generalization, but the general work culture is that you come early in the morning and you live in due course and, uh, by the way, as opposed to us, they don't take a two hours lunch break. They actually order in and sit at the desk and eat while they work. So again, it's just a very different culture. And the mistake to your question, my mistake as a manager was trying to apply my mechanism, my, uh, you know, my routines, the things that I was used to on a different culture and, and you know, therefore interpret the uh, deviation as, uh, as somehow as a bad sign. I think the only mistake that I, uh, stands out to me is trying to put on a show as if you know what you're doing rather than asking. <laughs> uh, there's no, that's one of the great things that, that this really is an ecosystem. Somebody knows the answer. Ask, uh, how did you find this guy? Where did you look for that incredible VP marketing, VPH? Uh, ask around, put it out there. Don't wear the facade of someone who has all the answers. And that just prevents so many mistakes, like, like ego usually leads you to um there's really no need to be uh, you're you're going to be the pioneer of what it is you do you don't need to be the pioneer of finding the best vp marketing in new york so that's it just ask use the ecosystem use the portfolio use the investors someone knows someone How you choose to view it. This is amazing. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Absolutely. Another one in the same realm set expectations. Again, we're coming from one culture. The American culture is very different. You really want to be very clear when you're hiring what is the job description? How does it look like? We're used to Israelis who are Rosh Gadol and like all hands on deck and doing everything. With hiring Americans, there many of them, again, not to generalize, are sticking to the job description 
And if it's not in the job description, well, that might not be done. Or they can tell, well, you know, it wasn't in my job description. So you really want to have a very detailed job description that cover that sometimes look too long and too detailed, but there is no such thing as too detailed when it comes to uh, the American culture. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes? What American people like to see in your games and applications? First of all, you can share your name again, please. Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of Noam, if I, can, if I may share. And he was just in the final of Unistream. Right, so congratulations. Just, just to explain, Woo! when I was Jonathan A's, I was still <laughs> drawing uh, cars with missiles. He's got his own startup, but yeah. So the question was, what are Americans looking for or characteristics of games and apps that they're interested in? I have no idea. <laughs> Honest, we talked about honesty yeah. today, right? No, so. what I say uh, in terms of games, specific uh, games or applications, I was look, it's a 330 million people market. Uh, you know, they have many different uh, tastes and many different preferences. Um, all like I can speak broadly about the games market because I've uh, I've spent a bunch of years in uh, in games companies. Uh, that uh, the general consensus is that the hyper casual uh, gaming phase is on the decline. So we've seen a lot of Israeli companies that were very good in prototyping very quick games that weren't very original, very, weren't very creative. They were actually mimicking uh, existing successful game mechanics. So in other words, we saw like. 10,000 different variations of Candy Crush coming out of Israel. And they were all moderately successful because, you know, it's pretty easy to copy a winning concept and copy it well enough uh, for it to be successful enough. Uh, but I think that uh, because of monetization, changes in the monetization schema in the allowance or in the liberty to uh, monetize with ads, uh, we'll see a lot less of that. Uh, and a lot more big, sophisticated game environments that actually require more originality and more creativity and more investment. But that's, you know, that's probably not the most certified answer you can get. Uh, people who live and breathe the market on a daily basis can give you a more updated answer. But I think that's definitely one trend I'm seeing that's a little bit concerning because there are a lot of game studios in Israel that will have to reinvent some of their tactics in light of this change. So hopefully we got away with that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Any last questions, please? Yeah, what's your name? My name is Gali Kaufman. Gali? And I want to see if you want to debate it. If it's not, again, it's not as much of a US question, but more like an international question. And you have a very nice portfolio on the top there. So I just want to get your perspective. Something very similar happened to me last time. And my question is, Great question. So you're saying after a bad meeting in the American market, should you leave this prospect alone or should you find a chutzpah way to revive it? Yeah. Great question. Panel. Remember that not <laughs> talking to them again is an action. And that action is validating their opinion on you. That is the impression they now have. And that is the impression they will now share. So the way to turn it into some sort of not even reactive, proactive approach is thank you, thank you, thank you. Take the time. We learned. We assimilated. Basically, we're not pitching to you guys again. We want to see what you think of the progress we made or didn't make this time. At the very least, you will have earned their respect as professionals that are able to, to achieve, to, to absorb feedback. Not doing anything is validating what they now think about it. And at that moment in time, it's not good. Uh, no, that, that, that was it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is what we've learned, how we changed. We'd appreciate your opinion, even if they will not invest and they're unlikely to do that. You know, at least you kept your face and you know, they have a much more positive uh, opinion about you. And if they're wrong, still take it and say, okay, what did I not relay correctly? in the discussion. 
Maybe they're wrong. Yes. Yes, at the back. What's your name? <laughs> That's so the question was so, so you mean when you work with partners in the American market that should sell your product and you're unsure if they will be able to sell it as good as you can because of their maybe different understanding of the product or, yeah. I think it's a classic manager's dilemma. You know, I come to the office every morning and uh, I let other people carry the actual, you know, they do the actual work, right? I, I raise money and I talk to investors. They do the actual work. Learning how to delegate and how to uh, convey the most important points and then supervise KPIs is just part of, it's another aspect of, uh, a manager's day-to-day. -day. I will say, by the way, and it's also a broader statement, that today the situation is much better. So when I first came to the U.S. when I was 24, I'm embarrassed to admit um, uh, how many years ago that was, um, you know, I had to explain people about Israeli technology. I said, listen, did you know that the uh, Intel Pentium chip was uh, invented in Israel, sure. as well as the voicemail and a couple of things? But there were only a handful of things that uh, Israeli technology had to show for. Today, it's a different situation altogether. We have a much better reputation. And in fact, you don't really have to mention that the technology is Israeli or not. Nobody cares. It's like, it's okay. You know, nobody's going to look down at you because you're Israeli. And I think that's, that speaks a lot to what we have achieved in that time period. Um, but I think that it's always uh, the case. Uh, you know, you are the, the, best sell the best salesperson for your product in its early stages. And if you're a good enough manager, you know, if you created a good enough product, then you'll be able to sell it. But then you have to also be a good enough manager to be able to have other people sell it for you, both internally and externally. All right. Yes. Yeah. So really agree with everything Charles said. Uh, another addition. Mm -hmm. It's great to be Amazon's partners. It's great to be uh, Intel's partner. But really, th their brand doesn't mean shit. The important thing is, what do they actually do? And very early on, you can see which of them give you the right quality attention. And they usually do that when they see, okay, if we sell more of this guy's product, we'll actually sell more of ours. You, the good indications are that you're beginning to see that they're giving incentives to their salespeople to meet quotas that have something to do to you. They write a battle card with you. Perfect. Quality over quantity as the amount of partners really, really important. And another tip, just because I got to meet that company, there's an, an American company called Tackle IO, T A C K L E I O. That's the company that's basically took over partnership for Amazon. They manage the partnership for Amazon and the onboarding. They write a lot of great content about how to prepare yourself to become a partner. So I would look them up. Okay, thank you. So I would like to have one fast tip from each of you to our audience that is now looking to enter the US in the next six months or so. So I'll repeat myself, I say baseball is a great game. <laughs> baseball. You know, sure, nothing <laughs> happens. They're a little chubby, you know, it's a little slow game. It takes hours, but you know, it grows on you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't learn anything that someone has already learned from you. Ask them and, and people are generous with their information. Find similar companies. They'll be generous with their time. They'll give you glorious tips, but ask. Follow up on that, right? Find the right people. Make sure you're not the smartest one in the room. Be polite, use thank you, and please get in those rooms and ask your questions. Thank you so much for sharing such an important insights that you learned with experience. And I'm sure I see, I saw how much you were attentive to this. So I hope you got as much as information and tips you needed. And good luck, everyone.